Yeah, we're not in combat mode. That's a plus. And the map doesn't appear to be huge. Well, it's large, but... And we don't have options where to go. Dietrich, uh, I want him healed before we go. Could you use your healing item? Okay. We're ready. As ready as we're gonna be, at least. Mm. Radioactive, radioactive. So... Reading behind a glass. The old man behind the glass works feverishly at his console, glancing up at you when he can. A cigarette dangles from his mouth, its bluish, bluish smoke curling around his head. An overflowing ashtray sits on the lap table in front of him. The years have not been kind, but his features are instantly recognizable. Despite his age, he still has the strong chin and the high cheekbones that you remember from Green Winter's DVD. This is Dr. Adrian Beauclair. As you approach, he stops what he's doing and a look of intense inner irritation on his face. He clears his throat and a harsh rasping sound emerges from the loudspeaker next to the glass. So, you are the shadow runners Audrin warned me about. I assume there's a trail of corpses in your wake. And you must be Dr. Beauclair. That's right. He scowls. I don't know why you insist on interfering with my work, but I assure you, that's over now. He reaches down, flips a switch, you hear a loud thud and a click behind you as the door locks shut. You'll find that the blast door behind you is sealed, and the laboratory you occupy is fully secured. An important precaution, as we keep our test subject in there, they are far more dangerous than you. You will remain trapped in there for your own good, so you can do no further harm. Yeah, we need to talk. I believe I can hear you well enough from this side of the glass. Now, I want to know why in hell you are so violently interjected yourself into my business. First you break into my state, which you didn't even know was mine apparently. Then you spend what I imagine must have been a small fortune to track me down. And finally, you locate my AI, destroy it, drive all, drive all the way to the countryside, and shoot your way into my laboratory. He leans forward, hands on the table, his eyes piercing. So I have to ask you, Shadowrunner, who are you and why in God's name are you here? came to find you, Vaclair, to help us fire, stop Firewing. Except the Firewing wasn't the one after us after all. It was you all alone, wasn't it? Vaclair sighs, covers his face with his pale, nicotine-stained hands. To help you stop Firewing. That is ironic. But yes, you are correct. I am the one who has been hunting you. The one who sent Apex and Odrin after you. You... You bastard. It 
So why attack Crow's Bazaar? It was necessary to preserve the secrecy of my work for the greater good of all. You know I have wronged you and for this I'm sorry. Besides the long rattling sigh that quickly turns into a violent fit of coughing, the sound echoes over the loudspeaker. He collects himself and continues. I don't expect you to understand. I also do not have time to explain it to you. He straightens, glances back at the screen to his side and nods curtly. Uh, things are progressing nicely. Now, I must know, how did you learn that I was still alive? How did you even know to look for me if someone sent you? Yeah. Your brother hired us to break into your estate. We pierced the, re we pieced the rest together from his journals. But Claire starts, and the sudden movement of his arm sends his overflowing ashtray flying from the table in a flood of fat. My brother? Hermy? It's been years. Have you seen him? How is he? His brow furrows. He takes a step for towards you impatiently. Well? I'm sorry, Doc. He was digging too deeply into Firewing, so Apex killed him. He slumps into the chair next to him, his whole body shaking. I... Uh, I didn't... He's suddenly overcome by another fit of coughing. He study, steadies himself on one arm of, of the chair. Apex, he gasps. Should have never trusted that thing. God damn it. He closes his eyes and tears a tear escapes down his the gaunt pale skin of his cheek. Oh Hermy, the things I've sacrificed, all for this panacea. All for tonight. Yeah, panacea, you modified virus. Your modified virus. What's tonight, doctor? What are you planning with it? He looks up, dazed, his eyes focused. Yeah, yes, yes, you know about it then. Panacea is, is my life's work. A permanent solution to an age-old problem. It will mean the end of dragons, not just Firewing. All dragons. Uh, all dragons? There are quite a few dragons out there, Doc. Powerful dragons. I don't think they'll support your plan. No shit. Okay. Explain. O'Claire fumbles in his pockets, produces a fresh cigarette. He lights it with shaking hands and breathes in deeply. The orange glow of the cigarette flares bright. When he exhales, the words spill out with the smoke. The firewing burned and murdered and caused untold damage in her bestial rage. Until the dragonfall, until I stopped her. But that destruction was merely a symptom of a greater cancer. Firewing wrought destruction with fire and claw. The dragons of today love were Dangalzan. Celader, they kill and conquer with subtle tools, Deceptor, deception, manipulation, corruption, he spits with disgust. They use us as pawns, playing pieces, puppets in their millennia-long machinations. Oh yes, dragons are a cancer, one that will conquer or worse, destroy all of humanity if we do not stop it. One that metastasized when the world awakened. An ironic metaphor since it was the failing of my own body that allowed me to see it. Yeah. 
Uh, cut to the chase, dog. I saw the no. Well, let's him go on. He is wrecked again by violent coughing. Allows it to subside. Takes another long drag of his cigarette. The ash keep creeping closer and closer towards his mouth. I have leukemia, cancer of the blood. No doubt brought on by the radiation of the socks. It was when I heard my doctor's diagnosis that I realized what I had to do, what my life's work would be in the time I had left. I'm sorry, Hermie. I'm sorry you won't be able to see it for yourself. I'm sorry I failed you. While Claire turns his attention back to the computer, stopping out his cigarette, he grabs a fresh one from, a, from the pack and lights it. Tonight I will release my panacea to the world. And how absurd, absurd that the instrument of, dra of dragon kind's destruction. He presses a button on the terminal and a large observation window at the far end of the room rises, rises slowly open. Will be carried out by Firewing herself. That's quite big. Through the glass, you see the prostrate form of a dragon far below. An enormous set of shackles binds it, and a maze of tube snakes into its body. The tubes connect in onto a cruel looking apparatus that has been mounted onto the wall. Son of a bitch, look at that. He found the firewing alive in the socks after all. Tonight, the Firewing will fly again. Infected with Panacea, she will slowly be destroyed from within. But before that happens, she will provide the catalyst for a global transmission of the virus. As if spurred on by the sight of the dragons below, he begins typing furiously at his terminal. Firewing's fire carries the agent, Panacea, in its uh, dormant state. Any metahumans exposed to her fire will become carriers, will spread the disease to other dragons, but they will be unharmed. When a critical mass of carriers is achieved, my panacea will become unstoppable, it will spread across the globe in a relentless tide. However, if it does not reach this critical mass, it will fizzle, die out, become inert. Hence the need for a ground zero. A flashpoint for a mass infection event. He looks to the ceiling, mumbling to himself. I'm sorry, Hermie, I know how you loved your flux state, but that doesn't matter now. Must be Berlin. Hold on, what exactly are you planning to do to Berlin? He continues his work filled with a uh, feverish energy. For Panacea to work, Berlin must burn. A sacrifice, one for the greater good. Firewing will breathe her infected fire upon Berlin. Thousands will die and the virus will take to the air in the destruction. A critical mass of Berlin's metahuman population will be exposed, but no one will ev even think quarantine the city until it's too late. Flux state lacks any centralized authority. Corporations will evacuate their own. Thousands will flee the city, infected. Oh yes, Hermie, Berlin is the perfect flashpoint. He mutters, his voice growing more detached. Wasn't supposed to be tonight, no. But this little intervention of yours leaves us no choice. So let us see. He squints at the, his screen. Tonight's wind patterns dictates that Ground Zero be Temple Half Schoenberg. Highly populated, the virus will spread quickly enough from there. That's only a few kilometers from Crown's Bazaar. Don't do it for Claire. I swear I will make you hurt if you do, and I'll make it last. We all know that is not going to happen. You are trapped here, impotent to stop this from happening. But Claire sighs, shuts his eyes tight bringing a shaking hand to his temple. 
I'm so sorry, but this sacrifice can't be helped. The old man eyes the cigarette butt in his hand, fishes out another from the pack and lights it with the first. Then he returns to the console, reaching to the side for a microphone. He mutters something into the receiver. You can just barely make out the second the sound of the name Odin. When he turns to address you again, his voice is level. The shaking in his hands seems to have subsided. Security will be here soon. They will take care of you. I do not wish you to die. There will be enough of that tonight. Uh, I don't think we can break the glass that's just retarded. Surely it's bulletproof. <laughs> It wouldn't it wouldn't hold in any kind of a creature if it wasn't so Look ignoring the rest of this insane plan. How are you going to get firewing to go along with it? A player continues his work. Oh, that? Uh, that's simple enough. He gestures to his left. She has no choice. Ooh. The gaunt woman in the containment cell stands rigidly, her face pressed against the glass, her haunted yellow eyes tracking your every move. She appears frightened, disoriented, lost. Her mouth moves silently, her voice muted by her glass cage. So the stories Green Winters found were true. Firewing's astral form was separated from her body when she fell. You trapped it somehow. Yes, yes, but that was later. In 2012, we took down Firewing fire with an experimental weapon. This weapon, suffice it to say, I couldn't predict how it would affect her. In 2036, I led a search deep into the socks. I had to know what had happened to her. We found her alive. In a way. Apparently, the dragon's astral form had been ripped from her body by the weapon. It was trapped inside a young woman living in the socks. A mob of glow punks revered her, treated her like a goddess. I transported the young woman and the dragon's body here where I could study them. You mean that she's been in that cell for almost 20 years? The old man nods absently. Uh, no choice. A creature separated from its astral form cannot live more than a few hours before both die. It was the high intensity radiation of the socks co combined with the magical creature inside her that allowed the woman to live as long as she did. So, Claire seems almost eager to explain. An environment within her containment chamber mirrors that of the socks. It has allowed us to keep Firewing alive all these years, while her bestial shell remains chained up below. Now, as for her body, that will be simple as well. We've drilled a series of electrical charges directly into her skull. When we release her dragon body, empty of its astral form, we will trigger, trigger all the vicious instincts and primal urges left in her reptilian brain. She will unleash her fire where we command it. Astral dragon stuck in a jar. Big dumb dragon's body rigged up to obey your commands. Got it. Uh, so the obvious solution seems to be for us to kill the woman. But the astral form would then escape. Or would it? Mm. Yeah, I'd go insane if I was trapped like that for 20 years. He shakes his head, misplays empathy. That beast lays a path of fiery destruction across Germany. But no matter, I have more important things to do than to debate the morality of this with you. 
Firewing must fly, Berlin must be sacrificed, and it must be tonight. Now, where is that damned Ordran? We can't break the glass, that's just silly. And all of this was worth killing your bro own brother over for. Eau Claire's fist and slams into the table, table, sending his cigarette flying in a cascade of sparks and ash. No, nothing can make that right. Nothing. He runs a hand through his unkept hair, blinking through a haze of sudden tears. Damn it, Hermie. Why couldn't you just let me go? Ah, uh, I guess we could try to drive that angle with his brother. Would Hermie want you to do this? You did not know my brother, Shadowrunner. Do not presume to speak to me on his behalf. Hermie... Hermie would support me on this, if he knew what I know. He wipes away the tears, looks you in the eye. This... This changes nothing. My brother's death only strengthens my resolve. Where, were I to stop now, his loss would be in vain. Berlin must be sacrificed. Yeah. It's a mass murder, dude. How clear Stephen's turn into face you, anger washes across his face. Was it the mass murder when America dropped the atom bomb on Japan? Yes. The myopic would say yes, just as you are now. But they did it for a cause, to shorten the agony of war, to save the lives of thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Hmm. Funny thing about that, uh, uh, I think Japanese offered to negotiate for peace before that happened. But the problem was, it wasn't an unconditional surrender, so that's why you really wanted to uh, drop the bombs, because there would be no negotiations. And I think the uh, sticking point there was that the Japanese wanted to preserve their emperor in control of their current government, more or less, I guess. So. Either way, it's still mass murder. Uh, civilian population, or you, they could, you could have chosen a worse target, sure, but it's still an uh, entire city wiped out from the face of the map. It's mass murder. It, a, a good cause can sort of uh, bring something positive out of it, but it, it doesn't change the fact that it's mass murder. You can debate about was it really worth it. It's hard with history in general because you you, you can only look at it in hindsight, and you you can usually see a path there that uh, needed to happen to get here. The problem is you you don't see you don't really understand how things could have gone or how things could have changed because it's too complex. You could say assassinating Hitler would have prevented World War II. On the other hand, it was on the time where nuclear weapons were about to be uh, invented. So it, instead of preventing World War II, it could have also delayed it. And instead, it, it would have, uh, but the war between, between uh, West, Russia, uh, maybe Germany, some kind of conflict would have very likely been sparked anyway, and would have been would have would it have been really better if it would have been delayed and the war might have been fought with nuclear weapons. It's it's one of those things that. You can see 
you can argue easily that you you are doing a lot of good, but at the same time, you are there's so many unknowns that there's no way to really definitely predict that it, the end results could have not have possibly been worse. And also because usually the alternative is you do nothing else but remove that one uh, one uh, action from the hi historic timeline. So it, it it's sort of a problem because that would never happen. You, it would be replaced by other actions. So yeah, in, in the case of uh, atomic bombs being dropped. There would have been some, could have been some kind of a. It doesn't necessarily need to be a bloody fight to the death where hundreds of thousands would be have to be killed. It could have been a peace negotiation instead of a one-sided uh, surrender. Also, it it did highlight the very threat and destruction in a real way of what atomic weapons could be. Uh, if that's sort of a if that hadn't happened, the the I guess the threshold to use atomic weapon might have been a lot lower after that, uh, and there would have been time to sort of gather up the nuclear arsenal, uh, and then when the act, I guess the threshold to use them in a war situation would have been a lot lower. Because a lot of the dangers, as far as I understand, about nuclear weapons, the radiation, and the effects, uh, have didn't you didn't really exist at that point. What it was sort of a learning experience all all around, and you didn't really know how bad it was going to be. And a lot of the research has been gone a long time after since. So, what we now know how how sort of a last resort weapon it is, I guess at that point it wouldn't have been. So it's really hard to say if atomic weapons would not have been used, would it have, re would this, would the war really relate to hundreds, thousands and thousands of additional soldiers from being killed? It's complicated. If you're dead set on uh, totally defeating Japan and have them force them into a one-sided surrender, I guess uh, that's a very uh, it's a reasonable assumption to make, at least in my opinion. But that's not the only options you had available, and that's usually why these kind of uh, historical ifs and buts sort of fall apart because you're 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 sort of funneling the option you're presenting into a path that doesn't necessarily have to exist in the first place if you're if you're looking at history you're just looking at the current timeline that happened and removing a single point on there and uh, so yeah that's uh that's a sidetracking rant, rant, rant right there, but it's not very convincing argument in my opinion in, in general. It's something that you can throw throw easily throw there as a justification for what you want to do. It's uh, but if you examine it closer, I, I don't think it's oh, it's not nearly as convincing and strong as it might first appear. Okay, well Claire is trembling now. I do the same for the good of the world. Um, I do like it though because you he's clearly the main villain in this game, but. I like the fact that he's not a cartoon villain. He he's 
he sees himself as a, as a good person and what he's doing is good. I, I do like that quite a bit. That's, uh, you don't see that all that often in role-playing games. And it's disappointing because that's more. Most people see themselves in this light. There's no one's going around to do evil for the sake of evil. They do what they have to do to get a go, and they think what they do is worth the worth the sacrifice or the cost. So, and I I can't really disagree with him here. But I'm not sure I want to sacrifice myself and my community and my friends and all my life because of it. That doesn't mean that he's totally wrong. Okay, I'm not buying it, Doc. Ending a war and exterminating entire intelligent species are two very different things. That's true though, but the thing is... I don't think Vauclair is wrong in a sense. They're, they're Im immortal beings that are basically using everyone else as pawns. And the, sh the tendency of humans to focus on short term will mean that we, there's never going to be a, really a time that we we can't escape. It's very hard at least for us to escape from that being subservient to them because of that. You could have that same situation with if you had a special class of immortal humans that would never grow old, never die from sickness, that sort of thing. So if they they would end very likely gravitate towards the top uh, on the highest positions of an a, of a society and then they would stay there forever because outside of violently removing them there's no real way to replace them they'll just keep gaining abilities gaining knowledge gaining power gaining wealth and the game gets sort of a as time passes the game gets it's a rigged game. There's no way for new players to come and win it anymore, uh, unless you resort to violence. Uh, let's go with. Uh, we're not at war with dragons, well, we. Uh, I think I'm not sure what the situation is with dragons in the Shadowland world, so I'm hoping he'll explain, counter, and explain this. So we're not at war with them. No, we are not. Not in a conventional sense. In war, there are size, battle lines, clarity. This is something else entirely, but the stakes are just as high. Higher, perhaps. Humanity was born to reproduce, to multiply. But dragons... Dragons were born to acquire, to accumulate, to hoard. Both try to bend the world to their will. Humanity has conquered the air, land, and sea through sheer numbers. Dragons, however, employ different means altogether. Throughout history, they have allowed us to do the heavy lifting while they pull the strings. There are 17 great dragons in the world today. 17 ancient worms, millennia old slowly dividing the planet into 17 piles of gold to nest upon, in front of our old eyes. Once upon a time, they burned castles to seal the treasure we collected, laid waste to entire armies. But here, here in the sixth world, it is no longer about tooth and claw and fiery breath. The old man's voice seethes with hatred. Now it's public relations, marketing, murders, acquisitions. You see it every day, dragons on the tridio, in the boardrooms, they gather influence, wealth, power, continually hoarding, hoarding until one of them sits on top of it all. Perhaps not in this cycle of the world, perhaps not the next, but one day one worm will stand alone, triumphant, 
with all of humanity as its castle, cattle, with all the world as its prize, and that, he trembles, that I will not allow. I'm going with the intelligence response here. It's not too late to rethink this, Doc. The great dragons wield enormous power and influence. Kill them and the power vacuum would prove catastrophic. But that's not a... I don't think that's a good argument. That's uh, that's something a, a great controller of power might use to defend his position. Especially since uh, the change in the power, the status quo is exactly what we want. So we have to break the... We have to do it, otherwise it cannot happen. So it's a, it's a, it's a necessity of what if you want to change how things are, you are going to have to alter the alter the status quo somewhat, and it's going to have ripple effects. It always has. That's that's unavoidable. But I'd like to hear what he has to say. An interesting observation, but pointless. Any power vacuum created through Dragon Khan's extermination will be filled by meta-humanity. Any black backlash will ride itself over time. Uh, I agree with him. It's a, it's a pointless observation, really. It's like just pointing out that things are like they are. It, yeah, it's, it's obvious. I'm playing the long game Shadowrunner, one that has played out over thousands of years. When you think on that scale, everything seems possible. Humanity will endure and dragons will perish. Okay, let's go with the biotech. You're going to infect the entire world with a virus, Beauclair. How can that possibly be safe? Viruses mutate all the time. An intelligent question for a change. Well, unfortunately I don't have the time to explain it to you in detail. And since you are locked in that laboratory with no chance of escape, I don't really need to. But understand this, I am an expert in my field. That is not an idle boast. It is a certifiable fact. And I have worked with nearly unlimited resources for over 40 years focused on one goal. One, 42 years of isolation, of secrecy, dead to the world, dead to my brother, all of this with my, my life's mission. It will work. He looks down. I promise you, Hermie, it will work. Hmm. Okay, I think that's enough. Yeah, forget this. Time to get out of here. Dietrich's voice is slow and quiet. There has to be a better way, Vauclair. There has to be. Vauclair stops, bows his head, and closes his eyes. I'm a man of science, Shadowrunner. A better path may exist, but I do not know what it is. I wish that I didn't have to sacrifice so many. I wish... I wish Hermie didn't have to die. But this solution is here, now, in my hands, and I choose to take it. Through the speakers, you can hear the sound of heavy footsteps approaching. Ah, Odrin. Good, it's about time you showed up. Sorry, Doc. We were waking up the dragon's physical form. It required some care. But the procedure is ready to begin now. You should see to it. The orc sneers at you from behind the glass, his scarred features writhing in the dancing light of Beauclair's monitor. Looks like you trapped the thugs who were attacking the manor. Yes, they won't be a problem any longer. But with the Apex gone, our security is still compromised. It's weed best to hurry. Oh, and Audrin, don't forget to clean the containment unit afterwards. The virus will kill Firewing along with the rest. 
and when it does, her astral form will perish as well, human host or no. They're going to stop you, Beauclair. We'll find a way. Tiger's lips curl into a snarl, and we'll make it painful. Modern twists suddenly towards the glass. Quiet. Everything's ready in the chamber, Dr. Beauclair. I think you should start the procedure yourself. Beauclair brings his cigarette to his mouth and inhales sharply, holding it for a long moment. Yes, my friend. He looks to the ceiling. It's time, Hermie. Let's do some good. Beauclair stops out his last cigarette with a heavy sigh. I will begin the infusion process. Autumn, please make sure our quests are here. Our quests here are securely locked away before you come down. I'm sorry, Aunt May. Sorry for your friend Paul Amsel. Sorry for Miss Schaefer. Sorry for the Kraus Bazaar. Sorry for Berlin. I wish there were another way. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So this will probably be our last worst for Claire before things start to happen. Oh, you sound just like a dragon dog. Yeah, that's horseshit. Messiah complex? Yeah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think Beauclair will try to find another way. He's clearly dying. He has a means at his disposal he thinks will work. He's going to go for it no matter what we do. He has really nothing left anyway, so he might as well. Let's go with the... You're not the same man who once saved Germany from the Firewing. I'll get out of here, Beauclair. I'll be saving Berlin from you. Fire flashes in Beauclair's eyes. His back straightens. You do not know me, Shadowrunner, nor can you possibly understand me. But I've been through... But I know with absolute certainty, the world may pass judgment over my actions when I am dead and gone. It will not be long and long now. Until then, I do not have the luxury of morality. I go now to do a hard thing, perhaps an evil thing, but a thing that is necessary. Beauclair fixes you with a weary stare. Weary stare, then turns and exist, exits. The room. Audren turns to stare at you through the glass. His lips curl into an insolent smile. I again. Long time. How's Amsel doing? That hole in his brain pan heal up okay? Glory fixes the orc with a cold stare. Sounds all you want. We get out of here. You'll wish you'll never set, you'd never set food in the cross bazaar. The burnt orc knocks on the heavy transplath window, separating you. Great, that's not gonna happen. His labs locked down tight, like the doc said. The test subject that they keep in there don't play well with others. Dangerous, nasty things, and they don't smell great either. But you'll see for yourself in a second. Hmm. You probably got family in Berlin, Audren. You don't want to see them die, do you? Dr. Beauclair is my family, asshole. He's a great man, a man of vision. I'm gonna make sure his vision becomes reality. He checks the monitor. Listen, I gotta go. Have fun with the test subject while I'm gone. He grins and presses a switch on the controls. You hear the hiss 
of a door sliding open nearby. If you're still alive when I get back, I'll put a bullet in you or something. Okay, so... Fire Drake. And that's probably not going to be the only one. Yeah, we are... We just need to figure out a way out of here. From what it looks like, we probably should try to get access to the dragon. If he's still there. Anyway, um, interesting enough our conversation. Uh, in general, I, I didn't like that, and I did like the options and the how he's justifying his acts make a lot of sense. You don't have to agree with them or the cost benefit calculation he's he's done, but he has a goal and he's. He's going after a very realistic approach to reach that goal. He's going to do a temporary sacrifice that probably won't be... He's thinking along... He's playing a long-term game where he's sacrificing... A, making a significant sacrifice on the short term in order to totally remove a long-term threat. It makes perfect sense. So, I think our to the talking is now over as far as I'm concerned. Everyone at this point probably has his own opinion about where he wants to take it. Does he agree or not? And the only thing is left to do the fighting.